I guess we'll get things kicked off here. This is our second meeting of IBD tie um, treatment idea. Uh, no treatment <laughs> information <laughs> exchange. I, I'm going to just change it to my. I'm going to. You can be information exchange for everybody else, but for me, it's idea exchange. And I kept on saying, and Laurie keeps on correcting me, and it's just like it's stuck. It's in there. It's not going anywhere. So thank you for everybody for showing up. Um, last, the, our first meeting, we talked about paleo, um, and paleo. Um, I don't like to paint any pa panaceas. So there's no cure for everything, but we did feel that diet is a um, very, very important tool. And I'll be honest, um, I haven't. If we're going to go more in, from a natural standpoint, without some type of dietary changes, I I don't see improvement. But there is an important second tier. And that's what we're going to be talking tonight, supplements. And as I always emphasize to people, it's called supplements for a reason because it's supplemental to something else um, and supplemental to a good basic diet. But even with a diet, we can always use a little bit of help and that's where supplements come in. Now, um, there's been an explosion of supplements out there and, um, and they probably all have good points and bad points and have merit. But at the end of the day, there's only so many pills you can take, whether they're um, vitamins or, or medicine. Uh, and some of the list of medicines I see are I, I, it's like, I think if I took all that, I'd be dead. I mean, there's, I, I don't think I'd be able to get out of bed in the morning. Um, but it's, with the same thing with supplements, we don't want to overdo it. So what we tried to hone in, and we had a little meeting last week, Terry and I, about what we felt were some of the most important things. And, and we're going to be trying to tick those off. We even had a little Facebook um, page um, voting. And I think we kind of hit some of the highlights that most people want to hear about. Um, what we like are, uh, first and foremost, especially in the gut, probiotics. Now again, probiotics like paleo, um, a couple years ago, a poo by water, you know, you know, it's like, what is that? Um, but now with the explosion of probiotics into the um, general marketplace, um, most everybody kind of knows what they are. Um, vitamin D is another very hot topic, and I'm even getting some of the most, um, what's the, obtuse, <laughs> um, physicians are actually checking vitamin D levels so that's something important and I'm sure it will come out this evening the even the people who set the who are these people anyway who set up normal values right well, you know who knows what a normal value is anyway um, but the people who set up normal values are the vitamin D are very very low and I think Terry will agree with me that I try to push most of my people above 50 that's a vitamin D125, and especially people with IBD, I'd like to see them up in the 60s. But we'll, I'll let, I don't want to steal Terry's thunder. Um, some other things with digestive enzymes, which help you digest better, are another important one. And, um, and those are just a few. Um, I wanted to kind of introduce the topic and kind of get your appetite wet. But we're very um, honored and pleased to have um, Terry Wingo here. Terry runs Madison Drug. He's been a fixture out in out in Madison for how many years? Twenty-seven. You don't no. You should have lied or something. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see. It. Okay. Well, twenty-seven years. So be it. Uh, but you know, when I came into Huntsville, the Huntsville area, I was very impressed that we had actually so many hunt, uh, so many compounding pharmacists to um, to draw upon. Because I think just like thinking outside of the, I like to think I think outside of the box. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but and a lot of our, our compounding pharmacists um, think out of the box, and I find them to be a great asset because I just don't have the time to maybe go over all these things. But I know when they're going to Terry's shop, they're getting the right information. So with that as kind of the setting the table, I'm going to let Terry speak about some of these um, supplements, and then at the end, I'm going to kind of give you my perspective of things, and then we'll, we'll leave time for plenty of questions. And if you guys want to come back to paleo, I, I could talk about paleo all week. So, and would, I'll shut up and let you go. Thank you. Well, I'm going to put paper up here because if I just go, I'll go for two hours. So <laughs> some of you know, it's hard for me to stop. I did put uh, some slides together, and I'll, I'll have handouts if anyone wants those to look at later. And in fact, my slides start with paleo, 
to bridge through this process because that's where we take everyone is from how we eat into what we do next. And we believe we're created to be healthy and self-repairing and we want to enable the body to heal itself and work back toward that optimal point. Uh, talking about some of the supplemental things today, we decided about five things that might be e interesting to touch on first, and the first was probiotics on my list. So, uh, there, I think one of the biggest things, especially in this area of concern, is the effect of probiotics in regulating immune response. And just from a real oversimplified standpoint, have a Th1 and Th2 immune pathways. Th1 typically is focused toward things outside us, Th2 toward things inside us. The Th1, when we are disrupting the flora in the gut, gets out of balance and no longer manages the things, and Th2 tries to take that over. That's when we begin to develop allergies to foods or chemicals or things like that. We have an inappropriate immune response to something that we should be able to handle on our own fairly well. And part of that regulation comes from having the right bacteria on board. An average adult has about three pounds of their own private sewer sludge bacteria that are in our gut. Ten to a hundred times more cells of bacteria in the gut than we have cells in our own body. Probably a couple hundred different strains that are present and vary from one person to another, although there are certain things that are very common, most common to everyone. Some of those, of course, we know about things like the lactobacillus strains and the bifidobacterium strains. Bifidobacter, among other things, produce short-chain fatty acids like butyric acid, which are managing inflammation in the colon. So if we're disrupting the presence of bifido, we're not managing our own inflammatory responses in the colon very well. We have a lot of things that change the quality and the quantity of bacteria in our gut. For example, we drink tap water. And they put chlorine in there to kill pathogenic bacteria. It doesn't have a switch to stop when we drink it. That's one of the things that's killing the bacteria in our gut. We eat commercial chicken or beef, and there's about 20 times more antibiotic by weight fed the food chain animals every year than is prescribed for all the humans in the country. So we're getting antibiotic residues with our foods that also can be affecting the bacteria in the gut. We have um, chronic stressors in our society of all sorts. One of those is insulin. Insulin resistance, by definition, is the mechanism by which we, the, the adaptation by which we survive an American diet. But insulin resistance is a stressor to adrenals. Anything that overdrives us as stress inhibits gastric secretion. And the biggest part of gastric secretion, one of the biggest parts, is to kill invaders. So pick enough stomach acid, don't let those bad guys get through. And so when we have impairment in gastric secretion, we're allowing more pathogens yeast, bacteria, viruses, whatever, to get through and disrupt the flora. Then they're competing for the nutrients that should be feeding the healthy bacteria. There are food sources of healthy bacteria from fermented foods. Most of the commercial fer fermented foods don't have a lot of value, in my opinion. Yogurt is one that's promoted so much. Commercial yogurt has to be pasteurized to sell it. Pasteurization is a heat process that kills the bacteria. So for that to be promoted as live culture, they put back a small amount of one strain, basically. So the most common probiotic supplement that we use, one capsule has as much bacteria as, as 10 cups of yogurt. And some of the others are much higher cell count than that. But even the minimal ones are much, much higher and much more capable of benefiting us than food sources like that. I think if we're going to do fermented foods, we need to ferment our own. So I would encourage someone who wants to do that to make your own sauerkraut, which is not that difficult to do. We will have a much higher cell count and much more beneficial forms of bacteria if we're making our own. And it's not been through the, the, the pasteurization process. There are other things out there. I don't know if it's been discussed in this group. Uh, there's a physician who is a, um, a Russian uh, neurologist who's begun to write books about the effect of immune regulation on fermented foods and healthy bacteria in the gut. I think her name is Natasha Campbell-McBride. I'm sorry? Natasha Campbell-McBride, if I remember correctly. Uh, she calls it the GAPS program, Gut and mm -hmm. Physiology Syndrome, or Gut and Psychology Syndrome. 
<clears throat> she started working with us because of autism. Her own child who was uh, having that she was, was found to be on the autism spectrum, not responding well. And she found that by cleaning up the gut, getting the healthy bacteria back, regulating immune response was making a big difference, managing the inflammatory responses. Uh, supplemented probiotics come in multiple forms. There, there are lots of them now. Um, a lot of marketing about that. One way to divide those are those that are refrigerated and those that are stored at room temperature. One of the basic differences there is that for the room temperature storage are labeled with cell count at time of manufacture. And the refrigerated forms are labeled with cell count at time of expiration. So there can be significant differences in those. There are some room temperature forms that are very good. There are some room temperature forms that are not that effective. Some that are marketed as probiotics that will have maybe, um, in fact, I've actually had some on the shelf in the past that someone had asked for that had, it proudly claimed uh, one million live cells. And the most common we sell, which is still a fairly low cell count, is 15 billion per capsule. 15 billion, not one million. And some of the others have much higher count than that. They're single strain forms. A lot of them are heavily promoted, particularly now that some of the drug companies are getting into the fray. So they can um, relabel or patent a particular strain as being the only one. And they've done a couple of studies on this and demonstrated how great this is. And so we have a lot of marketing related to those single agent probiotics. But the gut has a lot of different strains and we need to support across the board. There's some thought that we may not actually be recolonizing. We may have to continue to support because the ability of these that we're taking to actually embed and stay there forever may not be very good. Our initial colonization comes in the birth canal. So one of the things about some people who have a problem, those who are born by cesarean section don't get initial colonization from the birth canal. It's also thought that that initial colonization is stored in the appendix. So someone who's had appendectomy may not be able to recolonize after they've had flu or after they've had an antibiotic or something like that as easily as someone who still has an appendix. That makes sense. Um, there are some examples of commercial products. Uh, there's a product that's called, for example, symbiotic intensive. This is a powder that has multiple strains. It has prebiotics mixed with it in the powder, something to feed the healthy bacteria once it gets on board. Uh, this one has about 170 billion minimum in the dose, usually uses a once a day dose. We tend to use that in someone who's in crisis when we're trying to start something quickly. We tell them to expect you're going to have some die off. You're going to have some rolling and rumbling and symptoms probably those first few days because we're trying to be aggressive at getting some things to move in that situation. VSL number three is a fairly commonly used one, the one that's used in the medical model quite a bit. It's a fairly high cell count, about 225 billion, if I remember, per dose. We use a lot of Florigen three. This is three strains, not 10 or 12 strains. The VSL is multiple strain and the symbiotic is multiple strain. The three strains in here are bifido strains and lactobacillus strains, but they're the core. I think it was the core. And this is one that has about 15 billion. Different manufacturers use different terminology for how they label that cell count. And I found relatively equal effect of Florigen 3 and VSL number 3, even though one is labeled as 15 billion, one is labeled as 225 billion. And that's why we use a lot of the Florigen because it's less cost.